Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here. It's uh, on the one hand, I feel greatly honored to give the sort of closing lecture of this conference, and uh, I should also say it's as always, you know, immense pleasure to be here, and. Uh, uh, I really regret that I couldn't uh, take part in previous part of this conference because even from what filtered through from the questions and allusions to previous talks, it sounded uh, really intriguing. Uh, after some con consultation with uh, Thibault, I've decided to give a more general talk. So I apologize in advance to um, those of you who are really specialists, certainly string theorists will not learn very much from this talk. Uh, as I said, it's going to be a brief survey. It will be rather pointillistic, I would say, in the sense that uh, I will just touch on a few things and make a few remarks, and they will also not cover everything, but it will certainly take the liberty to spend the uh, last part of my talk on things that are very close to my heart. Um, when it comes to what a potential theory of quantum gravity could be. Um, so I would like to start out by recalling the reasons why we should be interested in a theory of quantum gravity, because at this time there's actually no pressing need from any experiment or observation to really proceed in this direction, because the theories that we have at this time seem to be working uh, extremely well. This is, applies both to general relativity but also to the standard model of particle physics which gets, which gets better and better with uh, every uh, measurement. So the reason to be um, nevertheless to be interested in the theory of quantum gravity uh, comes from basically from the fact that the two theories that we have are incomplete and possibly even inconsistent in the ultimate a consequence. Uh, on the general relativity side, it's the issue of uh, singularities, which, uh, which seem to be generic. This follows from the um, singularity theorems that were proven by Hawking and Penrose a long time ago, according to which uh, generic initial conditions, like the existence of the universe, will inevitably lead to singularity formation. And of course, there's the cosmological singularity, the Big Bang singularity at the beginning of our universe. And this is the greatest puzzle. In some sense, this is what we really would like to understand. Uh, I mean, one of the amazing stories of modern physics is that with the understanding we have, we can get very close, like 10 to the minus 30 seconds or so, to, uh, to next to the singularity. But it's just this tiny little bit that that causes all, all our headaches. And of course, there's the, the question of structure of space-time at the smallest distances. On the other side, in quantum field theory, there as well, we are faced with, um, with some, you know, uh, lurking inconsistencies, possibly. Um, uh, so, as you all well know, in perturbation theory, we encounter ultraviolet divergences in Feynman diagrams. For the standard model symmetries, these can be removed by infinite renormalizations, order by order. This is a rather sophisticated uh, procedure that has been developed over decades, actually, and, uh, and has to led to amazing agreement with, with experiment. If you think about things like G minus 2 or now precision experiments they're not doing for the electroweak theory. But nevertheless, uh, I think Costas showed this or quoted Dirac on this, who never accepted infinities. He said the right theory should give finite answers, period. Um, so, uh, so we're not really sure whether or we somehow feel that this cannot be the end of the story. And in some sense, you can make it a little more precise because uh, you can ask yourself if you want to go beyond perturbation theory, does the standard model, which works so well in perturbation theory, does it make sense beyond perturbation theory? And I think there's now some reason to believe that uh, it, it will probably not exist in the rigorous sense of uh, constructive or axiomatic quantum field theory. And this is the reason why people are talking about 
uh, the possible ultraviolet completion of the theory, that is some other theory that contains the standard model as a limiting case. So the difficulties uh, in both cases, in some sense, may have a common origin because in both uh, general relativity and quantum field theory, we treat space-time as a continuum or differentiable manifold, meaning that we can, in principle, should be able to go as small to as small distance as distance as we like. And secondly, uh, in sending quantum field theory, uh, so far we treat elementary particles as mathematical points, exactly point-like excitations, and this is of course the origin of these uh, ultraviolet divergences. But there's also a difficulty when you try to try to describe point particle mechanics in, in general relativity. So the conclusion of all this is at least a majority of the community believes in this, and this is independent of whether it's, of whether it's string theories or loop quantum gravity. Uh, you expect something dramatic to happen at the scale at which, uh, which we, be, well, we believe quantum gravity might be relevant, which is the Planck scale. So the question is really what happens, how are these theories modified, what happens to continuum space-time? Is it sort of dissolved in a kind of discretum? Is the continuum replaced by a discretum? Or what is it that, or maybe it's non-commutativity of space-time coordinates, but something is expected to happen at this, at this scale. So this is the relevant scale that we're talking about. Hopefully something will be found before that scale, otherwise... <laughs> well, we'll have to, well, I'm not, well... And now, with regard to, once you accept this point of view, that you can adopt two different kinds of attitudes. And they're sort of, this also marks the dividing line between the different approaches to quantum gravity. Uh, one hypothesis is that quantum gravity essentially is just a non-perturbative quantization of Einstein gravity in whatever formalism, metric, connection, loop, discrete. And uh, once you solve this and treat it suitably, you just have to complement this theory by the standard model of particle physics. And that this together then correctly describes the physical degrees of freedom, also at the very smallest distances. The opposite hypothesis is that actually general relativity is just an effective or low energy theory arising at large distances from a more fundamental Planck scale theory. And that we do not at this time know what the basic degrees of freedom of these uh, theories are, except that we suspect they're very different from either general relativity of quantum field theory as we know them. In this case, general relativity and with it space-time covariance, uh, such notions of space-time general covariance are assumed to be emergent, much like macroscopic physics emerges from the quantum world of atoms and molecules. And from this point of view, uh, this first approach would seem as sensible as trying to find out about the microscopic world by, say, applying quantization techniques to the Navier-Stokes equation. I mean, everyone would agree that it's very unlikely that you would find out about atoms and molecules in this way. Now, a basic fact about uh, uh, quantum gravity that sets, or uh, quantized gravity that sets it apart from the matter interactions that characterize the standard model is the fact that but, uh, gravity, Einstein theory, is perturbatively non renormalizable. This means that at each order, in order to get sensible results, we have to introduce a new kind of counterterm to render the theory predictable and finite. So here's the famous two loop counterterm uh, was, whose coefficient here was calculated some 30 years ago. So it's, but I should like to emphasize not just the fact that you have divergences, because you might think, well, let's subtract them and make the theory finite. It's the fact that you need to adjust an infinite number of parameters, and this is believed to render this theory uh, non-predictive, because then you have an infinite number of coupling constants, there are no chance to pin down what the theory is. Again, there are two possible conclusions in line with what I said before. The first conclusion is that somehow you have to, consistent quantization of gravity requires that we need to introduce a radical modification of the theory at very short distances. Uh, 
in particular include matter, supersymmetric matter, fermions, and maybe even something more radical, like going from point to particles to extended objects like string or membrane theory, and thereby to get rid of this divergence. The opposite point of view, also expressed uh, most uh, colorfully, I would say, by Rod Roger Penrose, um, is that actually the ultraviolet divergence are simply an artifact of, of perturbative treatment of the theory, because when we do perturbative quantum gravity, we do some violence to the theory. We destroy somehow the geometrical structure, uh, general covariance, all of this uh, is no longer there in a nice and manifest form. And therefore the hypothesis is here that this would disappear upon proper non-perturbative quantization of the theory. Uh, however, and this is something I would, I mean, whatever your attitude towards this is, I think no approach to quantum gravity can claim, can claim complete success that does not explain in full gory detail what happens with this divergence. Now this is, more e this is easier for approaches that start from particle physics because there one somehow tries to get rid of the divergence right directly. But this comment applies more to the non-perturbative approaches because sometimes they say they don't even see the divergence. I just want to say if you claim you don't see the divergence, then I think that you need to investigate your approach a little more closely because whatever your non-perturbative approach is, it should admit a semi-classical limit and then once you do this, then this thing will reappear. So there's no way around Anyone who claims to have a theory of quantum gravity and does not explain to me what happened with this divergence will not, I mean, I will not accept this as, a, as, an, as an answer. Are you sure you want two negations? No, yeah, it's yeah. not, because it, it, well, sorry. Sorry. it means the contrary is what you want. Yes, there are two they negations. They found this thing in your English. Ah, sorry, you mean double neg negative, sorry. Um, now, there's also the thing about gravity and matter. Uh, this is what Einstein himself said about his equation. He said the left side is built from marble, beautiful, unique. The right hand side, he said, is made from timber. This is the energy momentum tensor of watt, dust, whatever. Standard model, <coughs> Timmy Nu. So he, he spent a good part of his later part of his life trying to see whether he could understand this in a geometrical way. Uh, so the wish would be to somehow write the left, right side bring it to the left side and somehow understand it as some kind of... Uh... Wouldn't you agree that it's the other way around, actually? The <laughs> left hand side is the hydrodynamics and the right... The timber and this is the marble. Yeah. Uh, you mean the opposite of what Einstein said? Yeah. Depends well, on taste. I think and on this I would side with Einstein. Uh, anyway, this, this had led, has led to an enormous effort uh, over the past decades, really. For example, Kaluza-Klein theory is an attempt in this direction when you take the theory in higher dimensions and explain the matter-energy-momentum tensor as coming from higher dimensional geometry, so in part sort of going to, in this direction. And the other uh, uh, thing is that you can do, introduce supersymmetry, which is like introducing fermionic coordinates, and they're also enlarging your space-time, and then also endowing this right-hand side with a kind of geomet geometric interpretation. Uh, there's also the question of gravity versus not quantum field theory or quantum gravity, but just standard quantum mechanics, because we have this kind of schizophrenic, uh, Slava would probably say, situation where this is treated completely classically, and this should really be thought of as a quantum object or expectation value. And this has also led to a long debate. In particular, the question is whether we need to change the basic rules of quantum mechanics, as was suggested originally by Hawking. Um, for example, is it, should we really allow for the possibility that pure states can evolve into mixed states? And the other thing I would like to mention here is that, uh, because after all, at least my favorite approach, uh, uh, space and time are somehow thought to be emergent. And uh, so you should all start out with a theory that does not have space and time. And then I would just like to, to emphasize that many of the paradoxes that we think 
occur in quantum mechanics uh, appear in a completely new guise because most of these paradoxes have to do with non-locality and there you really need some notion of space or maybe even time in order to make sense of it. So the whole question, I just want to raise it, not answer it, is if, if you're really in a sort of pre-geometrical framework, uh, what's, I mean, what's the, what, is this a different question now or how, how should we address it? Uh, finally, the final point uh, is the so-called Heyerich problem, which is the fact that gravity is so much weaker than the other forces. In my popular lectures, I illustrate it by taking a pin and a little magnet, and then the pin is drawn towards the magnet, and then I say, you know, this little magnet beats the gravitational pull of the whole planet. And this is a rather direct evidence of this hierarchy problem, namely that the scales are so much different. So in particle physics we talk about the masses. We actually cover a wide range, so you already here have something like a little hierarchy problem, but all of this is tiny vis-a-vis -vis the Planck scale of 10 to 19 GeV, which is the equivalent of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So a key challenge and perhaps the, the crucial issue in this whole game is for any proposed theory of quantum gravity is that you should offer quantifiable criteria to confirm or falsify the theory. And in particular, you should, they should be such that you, they allow to discriminate your ansatz from somebody else's ansatz. You know, it's, it's not much is gained if, you know, I, you know, some theory that explains structure formation or whatever. There will be many theories or things like uh, hypothetical things like violations of uh, Lorentz invariance, if this was really seen, there will probably be many and in fact conventional explanations of such facts. So I think the challenge is here much, much, uh, much more pronounced. And of course, you can always say, you know, my objects are quantized in units of the Planck length, but this is something that we will never be able to measure. So here, some degree of sophistication is required. So here is a list of the approaches, not complete. Uh, I would say that uh, roughly speaking the community is divided into a majority part that does uh, a string theory, supergravity and so on. There's the more uh, path integral is something in between. Uh, there's canonical quantization loop quantum gravity out of which we uh, develop the modern discrete approaches like spin forms, group field theory and so on. But apart from this we also have non-commutative geometry, we have something called asymptotic safety and then you can go even more abstract to the, in the sense that you could even look for a theory where everything is just information theory. Uh, and I should say there's no agreement. It's, it's really that uh, we have different communities in fact, with very little communication, and uh, you know, Jörg showed this uh, different picture, but this is the same event, historical event, and as you know, uh, this event or this effort failed because at some point people could no longer communicate with each other. And this is something I also see happening a little bit in the different communities working on towards quantum gravity. And I think if you're sort of zeroing in on the right theory, we should see things falling into place and there should emerge some agreement. So I want to now go through some of them, but just very briefly. Now the first thing I would like to mention here, just on one sli slide, is this idea of asymptotic safety. I said that most workers believe that something has to happen on the Planck scale, but not everyone because there's the question of whether standard quantum field theory concepts are actually enough to quantize Einstein's theory. Uh, so this approach in some sense is very close to in spirit to conventional quantum field theories, RG flows, RG group and so on, and in fact does not require anything special to happen to the continuum space-time. Somehow I assume that you can go as much as you like below the Planck scale. So here one hypothesizes that there's a non-trivial, non-Gaussian fixed point and this really means, if true, that the non-renormalizable quantum, uh, quantum gravity is really renormalizable in disguise because there's some 
in this infinite dimensional space of couplings, there's a hypersurface to which things can flow. And uh, so, in fact, you would just have to fix a finite number of parameters rather than an infinite number of them. So the aim is then one constructs a scale-dependent effective action. One can discuss in some detail what this means, because in a generally covariant theory, you know, the measure of length, etc., is it's something that, that's not fixed a priori. So this requires some rather sophisticated um, assumptions. But this approach is essentially agnostic about the microscopic theory. It's essentially just the normalization group equation and what you put in as an initial condition. And then the hope is that maybe these things fall in universality classes. What would be observable here? Well, we don't see running Newton's coupling constant when we look outside the window. So all of this is going to take place after the Planck scale, which is here thought to be analogous to lambda QCD. So uh, observable effects would be very hard to come by. The only thing I can imagine is somehow that, you know, in this way you can predict that there should be a small cosmological constant at uh, large distances. But this is, remains a hope. So let me now say a few words about canonical quantum gravity because this is the first serious, was the first serious attempt to tackle the problem. And that, that um, um, was actually the first non-perturbative append, uh, attempt, uh, which was also background <laughs> independent, um, which is a direct attack on Einstein's, on the Einstein theory in terms of textbook methods of quantizing. Now what you need to do here is, of course, you have to give up manifest space-time space covariance by a split of space-time into space and time so that space-time geometry can be viewed as an evolution of spatial geometry in time according to Einstein's equations. Geometric dynamics then is defined as follows. The dynamical degrees of freedom are the spatial components of, of the metric. The components with one with a time index are Lagrange multipliers, the elliptic constraints, and their associated canonical momenta. And then the dynamics is defined by the constraints, namely the Hamiltonian constraint that goes with time reparametrization invariance and the spatial uh, diffeomorphisms are associated with the spatial diffeomorphism constraints. Now, the general covariance of the theory in the classical context is in this, in this constraint algebra, which is more complicated, but I haven't I've suppressed all indices. But uh, the difference between this and the uh, gauge, standard gauge theories, that the dynamics is somehow encapsulated in this Hamiltonian constraint. So what you would do in this approach is to uh, replace this by a functional differential operator. You express everything in terms of operators, and then when you express the Hamiltonian constraint, you get the famous Wheeler-DeWitt equation. This equation has been around for, well, almost 60 years. Um, nobody to this date has been able to make any, I mean, full sense out of it because it's ill-defined even by the slop sloppy standards of physicists. And, uh, and in particular, what you would have to satisfy, you would have to say what becomes of this algebra as you replace classical variables by quantum operators. And as we know from many examples, you would expect uh, anomalies, just like uh, in the case of two-dimensional diffeomorphisms, where the Witt algebra becomes the Virasor algebra. And in four dimensions, you would expect even more drastic modifications. And I'm just saying this because uh, classical space-time covariance in this theory it would be, be replaced by quantum space-time covariance, just like one here, one has a very concrete example how this could happen, but it's something that you have to prove. And this has proved to be impossible, or at least not. There's no solution that people agree on. There have been proposals, of course. So this whole uh, Wheeler-DeWitt program came to a halt uh, because no one um, was really able to make progress on this. And it got a new impetus with the uh, Ashtigar variables, which is a switch to another set of canonical variables. 
uh, which are essentially the following. It's like in quantum mechanics when you replace Q and P by creation and annihilation operators, A, Q plus I, P. So here you have the spatial spin connection. This is the extrinsic curvature. This is essentially the canonical momentum uh, with a parameter which was later called Barbera Emitze parameter. And originally this was plus minus I. And then uh, he was able to show, Ashtika was able to show that you have a new canonical pair. And uh, what he was also able to show for gamma equals plus minus i, that in this case the constraints, canonical constraints, take a simple and rather nice form. Uh, in particular, it turns out that everything that depends on this variable does so via this uh, curvature tensor, which we know very, this is just the young Mills field strength associated with SU2. So, uh, so it's almost like the uh, phase space of Young Mills, the SU2 Young Mills theory, except that you have two more uh, constraints that these are diffeomorphism and Hamiltonian constraint. What does the approximately equal to zero mean? A oh, weakly zero. Oh, you can put it weakly zero in the Dirac. This is the Dirac notation. Uh, now, I think uh, originally it was plus minus i. Later, people put this to a real constant, and I should say, in my opinion, this is where this whole subject took a wrong turn. Because uh, once you make this real, then the nice form is destroyed. You get some rather ugly extra term that is very hard to handle. Anyway, the modern version of this is loop quantum gravity, where you don't work with a connection, but with a path-ordered exponential. Holonomy along some edge, and the uh, course uh, conjugate variable is uh, the flux, defined like this in terms of this E variable, and then your wave functionals depend on these holonomies. A new feature is that the kinematical Hilbert space can be defined, but it's non-separable, which is kind of weird, but you should keep in mind that all the physical, new physics that is claimed to be associated with loop quantum cosmology, which is a mini superspace version of, of loop quantum gravity, analogous to the old mini superspace of Wheeler de Witt. All the new physics really comes from this non separability. This is one of the reasons they don't see divergences, because you know, normally you would put here a delta function for this in quantum mechanics. So when you square this, then you have the usual difficulties. But here this difficulty doesn't appear in this form. So this is one of the reasons they so far cannot see ultraviolet divergences, hence no anomalies. And the other peculiar feature is that although you're working with connections, there are no negative norm states. And this has to do with this uh, non-separability. Non Herman, have we, have we tried to construct young Mills theory like that? No, it hasn't. This, this program has not led to any kind of valuable new insights for young Mills theory. But it should be a simpler theory, and we know. Yes, now, yes, yes. So why, why is this going to work? Well, uh, I, I, I will not say anything on this. I, I just present the facts. But it's a good Okay, now, now the crucial, I mean, much of this is just kinematics, defining state space, it's scalar products, so it's just kinematics. The core question in canonical gravity is the Hamiltonian. I mean, first of all, can you define it, and then can you any, anything, do anything with it? And I will not describe this in detail, because uh, just this is a rather elaborate formalism. It was mainly developed by Thomas Thiemann. And uh, this is claimed to be a main success, namely that the, the, the Hamiltonian can be defined rigorously as an operator on this kinematical Hilbert space. Uh, by the way, this is the ugly term that nobody talks about and which would vanish if you put gamma equal to plus or minus i. This is a little bit like the Migdal uh, formulation of gauge theories where you just allow yourself to work with field strength and so on. Now, the proper def definition is rather, rather integrated. And the one thing I would maybe raise here, because this is a valid question, uh, the question is whether 
Hilbert space is really the right concept because what you find here is more, you need to go to some kind of distribution space. And it's also the question when you're talking about the wave function of the universe, does it make sense when you calculate scalar product, does this make any sense? Or is it such that you need to give up even such things that we take to be, to, to be granted in ordinary uh, quantum mechanics? Anyway, there's also some argument that this uh, Hamiltonian is, uh, is, is not very physical because what it does, there are these pictures of the spin networks, which, uh, which I'm sure you've seen. Spin networks are graphs with vertices and edges and uh, things like this. So what the action of this Hamiltonian does in some sense, it adds uh, what we call spider webs like this. So it, it doesn't really, yeah. Question? I mean, we know that the metric does make sense, at least classically. So we know that somehow in the gravity, the background, there is Minkowski or some background, which breaks the symmetry. But do this guy who works... No, well, the, one, one of the difficulties here is that the metric is represented, because it's like switching from Q to uh, uh, creation and annihilation operator. So the metric is represented by a singular functional differential operator like this x, x, so collide at two points. And uh, so in order to define a classical state, you would have to find a psi such that this, uh, well, there's i, j, I guess. That this is something like, this would be like a classical expectation value, uh, g, i, j of x. And of course, there are all kinds of difficulties in making this well defined. So it's, this is, this is one of the reasons. Like in the Wilson loop way of describing the gauge theory, I mean, yeah. we, we have this problem, but in the case of gravity, for sure, we know what these people, do, what, what do they say that we know that there is a notion of metric in the No, no, they say eventually they will be able to define a semi-classical limit and, but what, all, all I'm saying is, this is why it's so difficult for them to find a semi-classical limit because the metric operator is represented by a singular functional differential operator. So, uh, uh, Herman, if you start with all this for my desk, finally, are you able at least to quantize linearized gravitational waves? You're asking, no linearized gravitational waves quantization would require solving this problem first. Then what they are doing? What Nothing. Is small for? <laughs> <laughs> they don't really have metric. How can they do fluctuations of the <laughs> it's, it's all recorded here, so let's continue. <laughs> uh, let, you know, I, I, I've, there's no time to, because this is just a pointillistic yeah. survey, as I said. <laughs> so let me just summarize a little bit, summary and critique of these. You can ask all the yes. perturbative. Anyway, the, the, the non-perturbative approaches, this is LQG, but something that developed out of his spin forms, I've no time to talk about it, in group field theory. Uh, I put the main emphasis not on the things that we like in quantum fields here, but the things that we uh, like from uh, general relativity, which is background independence, although very often what it really is is only spatial background independence, because space-time background independence would imply that you solve the wheeler dewitt equation, Hamiltonian constraints, so that's not there. So it's, it, this is a bit kinematical. However, these approaches so far, they're not able to recover the semi-classical limit, um, but they also do not incorporate essential insights and successes of standard quantum field theory, which I think is a big shortcoming, like uh, anomalies. There, you see, this is one thing that's usually not emphasized very much. There are tons of quantization ambiguities. So matter couplings, the restrictions that we know to hold in the standard model, like anomaly cancellations for the um, quarks and leptons, that's a very interesting and very subtle consistency condition, is not seen in these approaches. But as I said, these issues will be hard to settle without a detailed understanding of how standard quantum field theory and the semi-classical limit would emerge from this framework. So let me now move on. Uh, Costas gave a very a beautiful review of, of uh, string theory, so this is, you know, just a uh, you, you said uh, poor man's Bourbaki. So this is a poor this is a poor man's version of Costa's uh, presentation. So superworld basic strategies now quite different coming from quantum field theory. There one tackles this perturbative uh, 
divergences directly by trying to modify gravity at short distances. Uh, this is by introducing supersymmetric matter because fermions have a tendency to cancel uh, bosonic divergences. So this is realized in supersymmetric series. It's also nice because in some sense it gives a raison d'etre for the existence of matter in the world. And also there are such things as maximally, I mean if you really want to push the notion of symmetry to the end, there are maximally symmetric point field theories, n equals 8 supergravity, to which I will come back, 11 dimensional supergravity. And then also one can go to supersymmetric extended objects where the hope is that the the point-like singularities due to the point-like interactions are dissolved by blowing up point-like objects to extended objects. So this has led to the superstring, but I would also like to remind that there's a theory called supermembrane theory, which you can think of as a non-perturbative uh, version of a string theory, and from it follows uh, this uh, famous matrix model. Now this theory is much harder to, to deal with than string theory. String theory is basically free field theory on the world sheet, but here on the world volume this remains an interacting theory and uh, there's been not been so much progress in understanding it. So as Costas explained beautifully, so I'll just list, go down the list, uh, of course, this is a huge subject. Uh, it's very much modeled on concepts from particle physics, so there's no problem with the semi-classical limit. However, there's a problem with, uh, say, the uh, formulation beyond perturbation theory. But we now understand that it's not simply a theory of one-dimensional extended objects. There are D-brains, there are M-brains, there are Kaluza-Klein excitations, and what have you. This is one of the big successes explaining uh, giving a microscopic explanation of black hole entropy, including, including uh, higher order corrections to this uh, uh, Bekenstein formula. There's all these ideas about holography. Some people think that holography is the key to quantum gravity. I don't quite share that. What would be a physical consequence that I might even be able to measure of this formula for the entropy? Oh. Uh, well, you know, this formula has been proven for, you know, very ideal uh, extremal black holes. And uh, first of all, you would have to find an extremal black hole in the universe and then... But suppose there were an entropy formula for a visible black hole. What could I do with it? Uh, not much, really, because visible black holes are... Well, the other thing is that the derivation is done in a completely different domain. Uh, it's, it's using D brains the way uh, uh, Costa. Same derivation, which is semi classical and applied to even uh, uh, startup. No, but I, I think there's a, there is a, a slight problem here because the derivation is done in a domain which is far, far away from classical. And then you extrapolate over it, and I don't know, 20 orders of magnitude. And for this, you have to invoke supersymmetry and BPS stability. If and BPS, you know, BPS is invoked a lot these days. Uh, for doing all kinds of uh, arguments and strings here, but you should keep in mind BPS is light years away from the real world. It's not, you know, uh, so, so, you know, the, of course it's a real, reigns a challenge to sort of uh, derive this formula or understand it for a real life black hole. Well, anyway, uh, there's a lot of new ideas that are currently being tested. Uh, low energy supersymmetry, large extra dimensions, and so on. And of course, I will not say anything about the implications for mathematics because this is something everybody knows and appreciates, certainly here at IGS. So what are the open questions? Well, I mean, it's, it's string theory has been a massive intellectual collective effort that's been going on for almost 40 years or so. Uh, but we're still struggling to reproduce the standard model as is, not some uh, you know, fancy extensions with tons of extra supermultiplets and so on. But just assume, you know, no superparticles are found at LHC. Then what are we going to do here? This is a real challenge. Similarly, it's a struggle to incorporate. There's no nice way to get a positive cosmological constant. Supergravity, superstring theory, love, negative cosmological constants. But you look outside the window and it turns out to be positive. 
Uh, I will say a little more about maximally extended supergravity, also in connection with finiteness, because the question is what is the place of this theory here in this whole scheme? So there's been impressive progress, but I would say there's still no convincing scenario for resolution of space-time singularities, certainly not cosmological or space-like. And the question that was posed initially, namely what happens to the space-time continuum at Planck length, is as open as it's ever been. So and the real question is really what is string theory, uh, in the sense that nobody thinks that at the end of the day, it will be the way it's done nowadays. You simply assume a classical manifold and then you have these Planck size extended objects and then you quantize them on this classical background. We all think that this is not going to be the final answer. So one thing I would like to emphasize, and this is a little bit a problem with all approaches, is the lack of, uh, there are too many ambiguities. I'm a little bit polemical here because uh, here's uh, this well-known number uh, of consistent vacuo, which is far too much for what we need. But uh, this is, as I said, this is a bit hushed up. But if you look at trace, trace the ambiguities, quantization ambiguities and so on, you also find that there's similar uh, um, non-uniqueness in, in loop quantum gravity in discrete quantum gravity, by the way, also in asymptotic safety, because, you know, I keep hearing these talks, I've heard them now for quite a while, and I always sit there and think, you know, this is working too well, because no matter what they try, they find a, a fixed point. For example, if you do gravity in 67 dimensions, there's also a fixed point, and I find it hard to believe that this should also work in 67 dimensions. Anyway, so, uh, you know, there's all this ambiguity, which is precisely the opposite of what I said. You should try to force your theory to make some kind of statement that can be uh, checked or verified or falsified. So the question is really, does nature pick the right, whatever it is, answer at random from a huge variety of possibilities, or are there criteria to narrow down the number of possibilities? So I think that in order to discriminate between growing number of diverging ideas, better start looking for inconsistencies. Or else, and this is something Gary Gibbons said to me about certain approaches in quantum gravity, said this is going to remain fantasy if, if we can't come up with a solution to this problem. So the last part, I would like to go a little bit more in the direction that I like. Uh, namely, the question of what is the role of N equals 8 supergravity in this. Now, N equals 8 supergravity was in fashion 35 years ago, and then it became came out of fashion with the advent of string theory and uh, obvious problems. But it has recently turned out to be it's much more finite than was originally expected. And in fact, up to four loops at least, it behaved exactly like Young Mills, maximal Young Mills theory. If it were to continue like this, then it would be a just as finite as uh, N equals for Young Mills theory. It was not proven to be divergent in uh, higher groups? Was not proven? No, no, no. no. Uh, Young Mills is uh, divergent in six dimensions. Well, Young Mills, uh, Young Mills is, uh, d d yes, it's divergent <coughs> above four dimensions. There's a formula that tells you at which dimensions the, the, the divergences start. And here the claim is that for N equals 8 supergravity up to four loops, when you survey different dimensions, it's exactly the same formula as in, as in uh, Young Mills theory. So it could be, it's not ruled out, it's not excluded, that it might be finite to all orders. And uh, you know, this is one of the things I now start worrying about as I grow old, older. Will I ever know whether it's finite or not? I'm not sure. Anyway, there, there's now an effort towards five loops, but as we heard yesterday, uh, this effort seems to be thoroughly stuck, so uh, it's not clear what's going to happen. Interestingly, the difficulties here at five loops are uh, somewhat maybe related to a similar phenomenon appearing strings here, because there as well as five loops, there appears a peculiar difficulty to do with the fact that supermoduli space is no longer split, which means you're not allo allowed to first integrate over the fermionic moduli and then over the bosonic. 
this is at least the one sentence I stood, understood from Witten's presentation two years ago. I didn't understand much more. But. So, uh, this is not excluded here, but even if it is finite, of course, you can raise the question, what about non-perturbative quantum gravity? What does it tell us about the resolution of singularities? And secondly, is there any relation to real physics? And most people would answer this question in the negative, but I would like to advertise some recent work, which goes back to some observation of 30 years ago, which could become relevant if they really continue not to find new spin one half degrees of freedom at LHC. And it is the following. It's a really very strange coincidence, which is the following. If we count the quark number of quarks and leptons, three generations, um, uh, there are 48. And this number is the same that appears in supergravity when you take the 56 fermions, spin one half, remove eight Goldstinos to break all the supersymmetry. It's the same number. And furthermore, the following strange coincidence, if you break the SO8 of any <coughs> 8 supergravity to SU3 cross U1, these are the representations you get for the SU3. And uh, this was an idea of Gelman's really strange. Uh, you know, I would never have had such an idea, but he said, he described it as a last ditch effort to, to salvage N equals 8 supergravity. So he, assi he took the standard color assignments for the quarks and leptons, and then furthermore assu uh, assigned the three, uh, the, uh, the, these quarks and leptons to representations of a family SU3. So this is a new symmetry that acts uh, horizontally among the generations in this peculiar way here. And when you work it out, it's exactly the representations that appear upon uh, this, making this decomposition of the N equals 8 fermions. And this is also a little bit curious. I think it just indicates one should start looking in unusual directions. Because one thing you see here that this SU3 family would not commute with the SU2 weak because it puts the upper and lower components of the would-be electroweak doublets in three bar and three of this family symmetry. Anyway, this, there's, there's this strange agreement. And furthermore, if you calculate the electric charges of these particles, so they're given here, and uh, then you calculate what you get from supergravity, it turns that they, out that they are sort of systematically shifted away by one of a six. So it's one over six for anti um, for the th three of family, and it's minus one over six for the three bar. So this this is this was uh, this has been known for a long time. It's sort of you know, think is this a mirage or is it you know something real? And in fact, we found already long ago with Nick Warner that this scheme is actually realized that the SU three cross U one stationary point of n equals eight supergravity gauged n equals eight supergravity. Now, very recently, we've figured out a way to fix up this, uh, this, uh, these charges by deforming the U1, but you have to deform it in a certain way that goes outside of N equals 8 supergravity. So, there's no extra motivation to look at uh, uh, even more symmetries, and I think this is really the core of the subject, namely the duality symmetries that were originally discovered by Kremer and Julliard. Uh, because we now believe that these symmetries are more important ultimately than space-time uh, symmetries. And what was well realized already long ago is that these exceptional symmetries become bigger as you go down, in, as you do a dimensional reduction. Uh, dimensional reduction means you drop the dependence on internal coordinates. It's just like Kaluza-Klein theory. But what also happens here is that you, by doing this, you transmute space-time, former space-time symmetries into duality symmetries. And if you carry this process to the extreme, all space-time symmetry has disappeared and everything is duality symmetry. And by doing this, you follow this chain. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this before. So this is uh, E7 that appears in four-dimensional supergravity, E8 in three-dimensional maximal supergravity, and below it becomes infinite dimensional. So this is, uh, this is now what we've been working on for the last, with Thibault, for the last um, 12 years or so. 
so this is the symmetry that was already conjectured to be in the dimensional reduction to one dimension. Now, long ago, I thought, well, you know, who is interested in one dimensional reduction? Because the theory becomes essentially trivial. You drop the dependence on all uh, spatial coordinates. But then uh, came this other uh, mysterious hint, namely connection or link with work that was initiated or done by Belinsky, Halatnikov, and Lifshitz long ago. This is BKL. Their characterization of the singularity. So here's space time, singular Big Bang space time. Um, and what they hypothesized is that as you approach the singularity, spatial points decouple uh, causally. This is just the horizon problem of inflationary cosmology. And what, what you get is a continuous superposition of one dimensional systems in fast approximation. So this effectively means there's something like an effective reduction to uh, one dimensions, one time dimensions, as you go closer to the singularity. Or in other words, the true symmetry of the theory becomes only apparent as you go towards the singularity. So this is somewhat analogous to the high energy limit of uh, gauge theories. As you go to high and high energies, you see more and more of the symmetries. Uh, maybe I should not... Ah, this is an, another, uh, you know, just to explain the philosophy. I said before that cosmological evolution can be viewed as a one-dimensional motion in an infinite dimensional moduli space of three geometries. This is what Wheeler called superspace, uh, which is a rather complicated moduli space, and uh, such that, uh, you know, the cosmological evolution is really the, like the motion of a point particle in this infinite dimensional manifold. This is what leads to the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, the wave function of the universe in Wheeler-DeWitt. This is the space it lives on. But, of course, uh, we believe that unification of space, time, matter, and gravitation should tell us that there's something more and not simply something you just glue to this space, but there should be more unified structure. So the question is whether they can understand the full moduli space and simplify it in some sense by embedding it into group theoretical coset. And this is the proposal that we have been following with Thibault, namely to somehow map this evolution of 11-dimensional supergravity onto a coset space, which is of this type, where this is uh, this the hyperbolic Katsmudi group, or algebra uh, E10, which is the maximally extended hyperbolic Katsmudi algebra. So this is work I've been doing over the last 12 years with Thibault, Marquenot, and Axel Kleinschmidt in particular. So E10, I've no time to tell you what E10 is, but you know nobody knows what it is, so that's one of the nice challenges. Uh, so here's a sort of the way the mathematicians would define it. So it's just thinking diagram, generators and relations, a la chevalier serre. Um, but you know, this, this of course works for finite dimensional E algebras in a standard way, no, no big deal. But it, it's just, you know, you think just adding a node to the Dinkin diagram doesn't mean very much. But what really happens is an explosion of symmetry. In particular, for these algebras, which the Cartan matrix is indefinite, uh, you have what's called exponential growth. And there's just no way known so far how to have a sort of global description of this algebra, not to speak of the group. That's even more complicated. So we've approached the subject in a somewhat pedestrian manner. Uh, I think this is something no mathematician would do because this is just too, too simple-minded in a way. This is the level decomposition. And the nice thing is when you do this with E10, you just they pop up the, the, the bosonic fields of 11-dimensional supergravity, graviton, three-form, and also their duals. But the explosion, you see, this is first three levels. If you go to 28, you already have more than 4 billion uh, young tableaus of SL. Just, just to illustrate the monstrosity, the monstrous complexity of this uh, Lie algebra. Because when you try to calculate like structure constants, you get stuck at level four or five. Well, my student Fischbauer, tried, he's genius with a computer, tried to go to level six, but he also failed. And what's worse is uh, no matter how far you go, you're sure that if you continue, it gets even more complicated. Anyway, we, as physicists, we're not too worried about this. We just go ahead. 
And so we've uh, really with this idea of, you know, mapping the evolution of the cosmological evolution onto such a coset space. So this is exactly what we did. Just restricting to the low level things that we can identify with 11 dimensional supergravity. And on this coset space, well, this is something like the maximal compact subgroup. And then we found agreement under certain conditions, but it's certainly non trivial uh, between the supergravity equations of motion and the sigma model equations. And the emergence of space time here is conjectured to emerge as follows in the sense that the information that was previously in the space dependence of the fields, of the field theory, now in some sense gets spread all over the E10 Lie algebra. There's no more space time to start with, there's just the Lie algebra, and in it are all the degrees of freedom that you would like to see in the quantum in the field theory. But of course, uh, there's a lot more. That's, it's not just this. Because the spectrum here, this level decomposition, when you expand it, it has about the same kind of exponential growth as the string spectrum. <coughs> so the, this is the thing I wanted to mention, just because this I find this really surprising. Because I told you that we, we had with Christoph Meissner, we found a way to embed this uh, or deform the U1 to take care of the, to get the correct electric charge assignments for the quarks and leptons. And I said, in order for this, you have to go outside supergravity. But what we've we put a paper on the net just uh, yesterday, where we show that this, this deformation is, uh, is contained in this uh, a compact maximal <laughs> subgroup, which is, uh, you can think of as an infinite dimensional extension of the R symmetries that appear in supergravity, SU8, SU16, and so on. And uh, I mean, first of all, I find this rather amazing that in order, you know, it would really be striking my mind if in order to link N equals 8 supergravity to the real world, quarks and leptons, you would have to go to such a fancy infinite dimensional extension of the standard uh, R symmetries and standard dual duality symmetries. And the other thing I would like to emphasize here with this, you know, you somehow completely change the picture on how you would get standard model fermions out of a Planck scale theory. And in particular, this, this uh, uh, symmetry is also chiral. I think there's more than enough room in it to also accommodate the electroweak chiral gauge interaction. So this is something I'm quite excited about, but uh, you should keep in mind, the moment they discover a new spin one half fermion at LHC, we're dead. So at least, this proposal satisfies the requirement. It's clearly falsifiable. Okay, so I'm almost finished. Uh, so here's once again the philosophy that we've sort of been following with, uh, with Thibault, Marc, and Axel. Um, so here's again this space-time diagram, a cosmological uh, uh, space-time. And of course, uh, BKL, of course, was just classical all the way down to the singularity. But of course, everyone knows that, or we expect, something happens at the Planck time. So at that point, you should really cut off your, the classical part of your manifold and replace it by something else. Which was, uh, Thibault always reminds me that this is the famous objection of Zeldovich to BKL. He said, it's all very nice, but after a few oscillations, you're already in the Planck regime and then, you know, can forget about your classical theory. So the idea here is really to sort of take this as a guiding principle by looking for the theory that comes here below the Planck scale and that replaces space-time by something else. And here the hypothesis is that it's the E10 over K10 sigma model, possibly, well, certainly quantized, which is something we haven't really done. And also, of course, taking into account the fermions, which I didn't really say much about. So let me conclude. To come back to my initial comment, uh, the, inc the strongest argument for quantizing gravity is the incompleteness of the standard model and general relativity. Um, and the main question now is how do we solve these, resolve these short distance singularities? 
Uh, and how can it, and of course, should be done in such a way that this resolution can be reconciled with the classical Einstein equations and continuum quantum field theory and so on. And this may happen either by dissolving point like interactions, like string theory, membranes, and so on. It could happen via the cancellation of ultraviolet infinities. N equals 8 supergravity is a candidate. Could just be then this theory you go down. There is no divergence. They all cancel. Or is there some fundamental discreteness uh, as something that LQG uh, speculates about? Now, all these modern discrete models like spin form models and so on, they're all models of discrete quantum gravity and they all have difficulties in this recovering the continuum space-time. And that's the major challenge there. Or is it just the most conservative thing that quantum field theory basically remains valid, but in, with, in a version with asymptotic safety? Uh, so I would say just, you know, where do I, I place my bets? I think symmetry-based approach offers uh, promising perspectives with N equals 8 supergravity, E10, that's absolutely fascinating to me. I've been fascinated by this during all my professional life, uh, but there's still a long way to go. So that's where we are. Thank you. Herman, can you comment on the statement that uh, gravity is equivalent to two copies of the Arduino's? Uh, or it's supergravity which is equivalent? Well, there are various versions. That's the kind of obvious version of it in string theory because you build closed string states out of left and right moving uh, open string states and you put two spin one to get, make spin two. So that has been obvious for 50 years. Yeah, but now it's um, now, in field theory, what these people in N equals 8, uh, 3 Bern and company are doing is this famous color kinematics uh, uh, duality, where they actually, for the Feynman integrands, actually replace the, the Young-Mills integrand by um, a gravity integrand. And the procedure is that for the kinematic part, you try to find combinations that also satisfy Jacobi-like identities. And then you simply replace the color factor by the kinematic factor that depends on momenta and polarizations. But this is actually where they're now having difficulties at five loops. So it's not clear whether this really works to all orders. So what we had yesterday sounded more like uh, eventually you have to give up on that idea or if it works you have to modify it in a somewhat substantial manner. Okay. In this picture of a billiard movement near a singularity, so how should I think of it for a Schwarzschild singularity? What happens? Well, that's that's uh, that's uh, of course the time reversed picture, but uh, the uh, idea is that you know the Schwarzschild singularity is also space-like. So as you fall into it, what it's happens? a precise. Well, the, the the mixer, you will be stretched and squashed. And I always like to emphasize you will be, I mean, it's quashed to a point ultimately. But this will happen in an extremely interesting way because before you get there, classically at least, you would be stretched and squashed in many different directions. And of course, then ultimately, you know, once again to the Planck regime, of course, the classical theory breaks down and then you have to you know, invoke whatever the quantum, proper quantum... But will I come out ever? Or? Not with a Schwarzschild, you just... Uh... <laughs> of course, what happens in the quantum theory, I don't know. But it's, this is just not known. There are some recent indication in the work with Philip Chandler is that the term quantum infermions gives a balanced behavior, but this is... So there is something... Quantum and fermion within this thing is still uh, to be explored, understood physically. Yes. You, do you have a question? No. no. Yes. Are there more questions? <coughs> is waiting his hand. Yes. Uh, if, even if uh, n equal eight supergravity is proven to be finite, does it mean it's non-ambiguous? What do you mean non-ambiguous? Well, there are certain quantum field theories which are finite, but nevertheless ambiguous. In what sense? You mean there, there are more than one theory that 
as this property. Well, well, one example is Sean Simon's theory in three dimensions, where you have to work hard to find divergences. However, the answer is not in the, in the theory. I mean, well, it's just this long discussion, debate in, well, an endless debate about should you find k or k plus g in, when you make yeah, a, yeah. a perturbation theory. So, is there something analogous in any? Well, there are certainly ambiguities here uh, in the sense that the n equals 8 can appear with, with a, in a gauged version. There are different versions of the gauged supergravity, although the SO8 is almost unique, ex well, except for some recently found modification. Um, but what I would like to emphasize here, and this was my last remark, is that you know, if there's any link to the real world, it's not just n equals 8 supergravity. Even with this quark lepton thing, this seems to indicate, you, you know, you have to go beyond it in a certain controlled way that's, I hope, controlled by this, this fancy infinite dimensional duality symmetries. Okay, more. Let us thank uh, Hermann. Oh.